You know, when we talk about history, we think in terms of Columbus discovering America. If you're like I was when I was a little kid growing up, why Columbus discovered America, and we have a holiday on October the 12th every year that we celebrate the discovery of America. One day, I was traveling with my wife in Illinois, and she looked over at me, and she said, well, would you like to visit one of the pyramids here in Illinois? And I said, pyramids? And she said, yes, there's about seven or eight of them here. And uh, not far from here, just a few miles, is one of those big pyramids. And I said, well, who built it? And she said, well, nobody seems to know. And I said, well, how big is it? And she said, well, it's uh, several hundred feet high and it covers several acres. It's as big as the Great Pyramid of Egypt. And I was amazed. I'd never heard of such a thing. I said, here in Illinois, there's a pyramid And she said, yes, not just one, but seven or eight. And I said, yeah, I got to see this. And so we drove off the main highway, and we drove a little while, and pretty soon here out in the middle of the flatlands of Illinois, rising on the horizon was this big hill. We drove over to the big hill. It was covered by brush and trees, and and, uh, we went into the park. It's It's a state park. And uh, <clears throat> paid our fee, and we walked in. I stood at the bottom of it, and I looked at this, and I said, Hmm, why is it that I have been educated in America, went to the public school system, and here is a monument 400 feet high, sitting in the middle of a cornfield, covering about 15 or 20 acres of ground, a humongous mound of earth, And I never heard about it. And I'm 42 years old. Never heard about it. Well, it's not the only thing that I haven't heard about. It's not the only thing that you probably hadn't heard about. But have you ever heard about Egyptian hieroglyphics here in America? Have you heard about any monuments, writings, or coins found here in America that predate Columbus? How about Irish Ogham writing, Phoenician coins, Roman pottery, Norse burial mounds found in West Virginia, Georgia, Michigan, Arkansas, Illinois, Iowa, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Colorado, just to name a few places where these sites and these discoveries have been found. And then ask yourself, what did you hear when you went to school, when you went to college? Maybe you're an archaeologist or an anthropologist. Did you ever hear about America B.C.? Well, we've heard about the Indians, and we ascribe these monuments and these strange phenomena to these Indians who deny them. And when you ask the Indians of Illinois, did you or your people or any any history in the past build these pyramids out here? And they'll tell you, nope, nope, we didn't build them. Do you know who did? And they'll say, nope, nope, we don't know who did. We don't know who built them. We didn't, but there they are. And they are totally ignored in the literature. I mean ignored like they never existed. It's not the first time I've ever seen this kind of hiding the truth. We see it in politics. We see it in economics. We see it in medicine. And the truth is we find it in science also. For instance, in March of 1493, the Catholic Church was presented with an unforeseen problem. Christopher Columbus had just landed in Lisbon after an eight-month voyage that was to have taken him to the Indies, but instead of going to the Indies, it had led him to discover a new world. And the difficulty now confronting the prelates of the Catholic Church was that he had returned with passengers, American Indians, who had all of the appearance of being human beings. But how could their existence be accounted for? The biblical account of creation described three continents, each occupied by the seed of three sons, the three sons of Noah who survived the flood, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Columbus seems already to have been aware of the impending theological problem because in a letter dated February 15, 1493, written at the Canary Islands, he assured King Ferdinand that the people that he found were no monsters, but on the contrary were very well formed, neither were they Negroes, 
And when he put ashore in Lisbon on March 6th, his journal records, many people came to see the Indians, and it was a great marvel. As the second and third and later voyages produced ever-mounting evidence of large numbers of man-like creatures inhabiting the Americas, a cold wind of skepticism began to blow through the monasteries to ruffle the equanimity of those who so boldly preached the absolute truth of Genesis. And for a time, Rome disregarded the matter, as Pope Alexander VI was otherwise engaged, save only when he found time to draw a line of demarcation between the Spanish and the Portuguese portions of the New World. But in 1512, a new pope summoned the Fifth Lateran Council and issued an official declaration certifying that American Indians are true descendants of Adam and Eve and hence they are human beings. The failure of the Bible to account for them and to account for their continent was made good by the inference that American Indians are the descendants of Babylonians expelled from the Old World on account of sins of their ancestors. Now backed by this new authority, it was now safe for speculative churchmen to ponder the route from the Garden of Eden to America. After considering the possibilities that Noah's Ark might have added an American port of call to her scheduled sailing plan, or that angels might have transported people across the ocean, holding them by the hair of the head, like to the prophet Abacuc, a Spanish thinker, Jose de Acosta dismissed both propositions in favor of transportation by shipwreck and accidental tempest of the weather. Now, the inquiry was now taken up by others, and by the 17th century, both Protestant and Catholic churchmen were agreed that Asia must have been the original homeland of the American Indian forefathers because only the rude Tartars above all nations on earth resemble the inhabitants of America in respect of their gross ignorance of letters and of the arts, their idolatry, and above all, their incivility. Alas, for Pocahontas, there was no Fenimore Cooper on hand to defend the Six Nations, no Deerslayer yet to win hearts or minds for the dwellers in the wilderness. One dissident, Cotton Mather in Boston, in the course of a long series of extraordinary letters to the Royal Society of London, drew attention to the existence in Connecticut of a tribe of Indians which practiced circumcision, thereby showing he thought that the American Indians should be considered as the lost tribes of Israel. Voltaire, on the other hand, considered that the American Indians had arisen de novo in America by whatever mechanism had similarly caused human beings to appear upon the face of the earth in the other continents. By 1811, Such scientists as Humboldt recognized the similarities between some American tribes and those of the Mongol race, and he postulated that the American Indians are descended from a mingling of ancient Americans and later in-wanderers from Asia. Later still, most of the anthropologists came to agree that all American Indians are descended from ancestors that entered the Americas by way of the Bering Strait, and that no European came to America before Leif Erikson or Columbus. Now, in recent years, one lone voice has protested this kind of oversimplification, that of Harold Sterling Gladwin. And in his various writings, Gladwin has repeatedly drawn attention to cultural features and material objects, particularly pottery, that show that American tribes must have had relatively recent contacts with the Old World of Europe and the Middle East, especially with the Mediterranean and with the Orient. The nature of the various art styles to which he drew attention is such as to point to direct voyages between the Old World and the Americas as late as classical times about 2,000 years ago, or about the time of Christ. Gladwin's views have, until very recently, been strictly ruled out, anathema, and they have been excluded from the college curriculum. 
Now, fortunately, this exclusionist attitude is now considerably ameliorated. His writings, once forbidden reading in colleges and universities in America, have now been and have become prescribed texts at places such as Harvard. Now, for generations, the archaeological world has been beset by the notion that only the navigational techniques introduced in Europe in the 15th century made it possible for Europeans to cross the Atlantic, although some grudging acquiescence is conceded to those who point to the evidence of the sagas, showing that the Viking crossings by way of Greenland, which occurred before Columbus, have been well documented. So at the time when Gladwin issued Men Out of Asia in 1947, he too felt compelled to bring the Mediterranean influence to the Americas by way of an Asian and or Indonesian land-hopping route. The vectors being supposedly the ships of the fleet of Menarchus, left stranded in Asia after the death of Alexander the Great. Well, in recent years, new discoveries in the Pacific Caves have begun to lend much support to this facet of Gladwin's theories, but at the same time, the newer evidence also shows very clearly that the Atlantic was by no means the great barrier that earlier thinkers had supposed. So what, it is reasonable to ask then, is this newer evidence? Well, in fact, it is not new in and of and by itself because it has lain intact for more than 2,000 years. All that is new is our ability to read the inscriptions concerned because, indeed, they are written and, in some sense, documents carefully engraved on the bedrock of America, on temple lintels, and on the gravestones of kings and chiefs. And they speak to us of a long-forgotten age of exploration and of colonization, which is the subject of this book. When American archaeologists first began to send me inscriptions for decipherment and translation, I was astonished to learn that such documents existed here in America. All of my earlier work had been on ancient tablets and cave inscriptions of the Old World, records of the Sea Peoples of the Bronze Age and Early Iron Age some three to 4,000 years ago. But what I now began to receive from unimpeachable sources here in North America were essentially the same types of documents, engraved in stone, and they were either excavated from some archaeological site or they were recorded from cliff faces or photographed on massive rocks discovered by the early colonists. And I'd never seen such materials mentioned or illustrated in any books on archaeology of the Americas, and indeed I was totally oblivious to their existence. How is it, I asked my friend and colleague Professor George Carter of Texas, that you are sending me all of these materials. Has no one studied them before? Well, his answer was, for 75 years I have been knocking on the study doors of professors of Greek and Latin. And each time I have been told that the objects that I had in my hand look like writing, but that it is not Greek, and that it is not Latin, nor is it any script known to my consultants. So I emerged no wiser than before. Now, the very manner in which George Carter and I were brought together is in itself instructive because it illustrates both the difficulties now besetting communication between men working in different disciplines and the strengths of those more liberal institutions of learning that encourage their faculty to cross the lines that divide the disciplines. Carter was trained as an archaeologist at the University of California at Berkeley but he has chosen to devote much of his life to the study of the geographical distribution of man and his domesticated plants and animals. Through his research at John Hopkins and then later at Texas A&M, his work became well known to biologists at Harvard, especially to botanists working on the evolution and distribution of plants cultivated by man around the world. Now, I, for my part, though a marine biologist, have spent much of my life studying the ancient voyages of people who left inscriptions on remote islands, which, of course, could only have been approached by sea. 
As a marine biologist, I felt obliged to examine this evidence because it would have a bearing on how the dispersal of man, plants, and animals might be influenced by ocean currents and winds. So the decipherment of these ancient inscriptions, the art of epigraphy, became my second specialty. And it was through my fellow biologists at Harvard that Carter and I were introduced to each other's work. I learned that he had amassed a fine collection of American inscriptions in the hope that their eventual decipherment might explain or illuminate his own researches, and he, for his part, now found a man who claimed to recognize the languages on his tablets. We soon found that the emerging information is consistent with our other independent investigations, and so the seal was set on a collaboration that proved very, very rewarding. When word began to appear in linguistic and archaeological periodicals of this joint effort, other archaeologists and some linguists contacted us. A flow of information now began that soon swelled to proportion to proportions far beyond anything that either George Carter or I had dreamed of. The Epigraphic Society was established, and we began to publish our findings, as well as those of others, in a form readily available to other interested people, both professional and amateur. So began the busiest and most productive period of my life, an exciting journey through space and time, bringing new friendships in a score of countries. From the information that we gleaned from the first American tablets to be deciphered, we gained important hints as to where more inscriptions might be expected to be found. So I deserted my study table and the world of dictionaries for a while to spend a wonderful summer crisscrossing the hills and valleys of the New England countryside, rejoicing whenever a terrace or ridge top yielded yet another inscribed stone. My field companions and I became deeply aware of the presence all around us of traces of a vanished civilization that had once flourished here in America. Of these New England excursions, I was most often accompanied by John Williams, a young schoolteacher from Connecticut, who soon made himself expert in detecting the presence of inscribed rocks beneath the soil and later carried out many exploratory trips on his own. Between the two of us, we covered some 11,000 miles on the roads and hundreds of miles on foot, clambering up hillsides or more often pushing through the woodlands that once more occupy much of the back country of New England. We were often joined by my wife, Renee, who occasionally made discoveries of her own. Another frequent companion was Peter J. Garfall, joined later by Joseph D. Germano, who, whenever they would spare the time, would bring their cameras to record these finds. And when the suggestion was made at one stage in one of the newspapers that we might be forging the inscriptions, it became increasingly necessary to have cameras as well as witnesses on hand to record the thick coat of lichens covering these inscriptions before they were brushed clean for making a plaster cast. Other companions from time to time were our archaeologist friends and local residents who sometimes could lead us directly to a site known to them. Now, these were long days from dawn until near midnight, but we managed to bring back to Boston a very fine series of aluminum foil impressions from which casts could be prepared on days when the weather forbade this type of field work. The alphabets and languages that we found on American inscriptions are fully discussed later in this book. But the representative examples on pages 21 and 22 show how the American colonists or visitors wrote in the first millennium B.C. So let's note the similarity to corresponding examples from Europe. Now, while John Williams and I roamed the New England outback country for Celtic inscriptions, another colleague was making notable finds in the Midwest and the Southwest. This was Gloria Farley, an intrepid explorer of the cliffs and caves that border the banks of the Arkansas and the Cimarron Rivers and their tributaries. 
Armed with camera and snake bite anti-venom, rubber latex for making impressions and a ladder, Gloria Farley systematically assembled a remarkable series of records of visits and settlements by European voyagers who had ascended the Mississippi River and then turned west to follow the Arkansas River, eventually to reach the Cimarron River along the border between Oklahoma and Colorado. Her discoveries showed that some Celts had followed this southern route and that Libyans and Punic-speaking Iberians and even one Basque king had ventured into the heartland of the continent centuries before Christ. Gloria Farley will be remembered for these fine contributions to our national archives. A bright example of grit and determination in the face of discouragement on the part of those who might have helped her. On account of the skepticism and even opposition to our work that we experienced at first from some of the professional archaeologists, nearly all of the inscriptions that we first examined were ones that we discovered ourselves. John Williams and Gloria Farley being the leading explorers. Later, when our work became better understood, we began to receive valuable help from museum curators and some universities or other institutions where mysterious inscribed stones or tablets had been deposited by finders long ago. We received no financial support from any scientific fund, but through the generosity and faith of Ruth K. Hanner, the Epigraphic Society has been able to establish its own modest fund, and this, supplemented by our family budgets, has financed our travel expenses and the cost of latex and other materials needed for making copies of inscriptions that we have found cut in the rock. Those who have participated in this exploration include Malcolm Pearson, a gifted photographer who has recorded inscriptions for many years and who originally led William Goodwin to the ruins at Mystery Hill. James Whittall, architect, archaeologist, a Harvard graduate and authority on the megalithic structures of Portugal, Spain, and of New England. Robert Stone, the curator and present owner of the Mystery Hill site in New Hampshire, which he has protected and opened to the public and who first demonstrated the existence of an ancient astronomical observatory among the ruins in an American setting. Elizabeth Sincerbo of Vermont, who perceived the antiquity of the supposed colonial root cellars, and encouraged a young amateur astronomer, Byron Dix, to investigate what he later discovered to be calendar sites in that state. These, and others to be named in later pages, were the colleagues who now became our closest collaborators and who, like us, had to endure much opposition. But the work was its own reward, and all of us who took part in this research agree that we lived in exciting days, and we loved every minute of them. And yet these treasures are endangered. Christopher McIntosh, an English investigator, has given an account of the ever-increasing threat of destruction of ancient sites as a result of modern highway construction and like developments. He called his 1971 report the race to save Britain's past. And it often seemed to us in Vermont that we, too, are racing against time, with the added threat of vandalism. And as the months went by, I perceived a change in the attitude of my field collaborators who seemed to become imbued with a new zest, determined to save these relics, come what may. Well, boys and girls, that's Chapter 2 of America B.C. It's the introduction to a wild new concept. That concept is that ancient explorers from the Middle East, the Far East, and Europe came to America by way of the Atlantic Ocean, sailed across the ocean, and had ports of coal, colonies, and were digging tin, copper, and iron ore out of the Americas, loading it on ships, and hauling it back to their home ports of coal. Sounds preposterous that this was going on in the days of David and Solomon, the kings of Israel, of the ancient Phoenicians, the Egyptians, the Romans, the Greeks... But yes, boys and girls, it's true. There was an America B.C. All right, America B.C. is written by Barry Fell. Barry Fell is a professor, was, he's dead now, at Harvard University. 
And as you see here, looking at the monuments, the Americans' oldest archives, the Americas' oldest archives, is an 18-chapter presentation published back in 1989. It was first copyrighted in 1976, last published in 1989 by Barry Fell. You can probably get a copy at Barnes & Noble. That's pretty common today. I think the book is still in print. If you can't get it there, I'm sure that any used bookstore hooked up to the computer network can find a copy for you. It's fascinating reading. I picked up a copy because of a because of a meeting that I had with uh, one of his collaborators, uh, a lady by the name of Gloria Farley. She died just recently. Now, both of these people have been doing this for 50 years. So go back 50 years and starting around 1955 or 60 or 65 or 70. These people were out in the fields. They were out in Arkansas looking at, at burial mounds. They were, they were going up and down the Arkansas River looking at Hebrew and Irish ogham writing and trying to decipher it, trying to figure out, well, where'd this come from? So they'd go to the Indian tribes and they'd say, well, now let's see. You, you Navajo Indians live here. Or you, you uh, Cherokee Indians lived here. Do you know anything about that? And the Indians would say, well, no, we, we didn't do that. That's not a part of our culture. But there it is. Well, if the Indians didn't put it there, <clears throat> then somebody else obviously did. As I began today's program, I said, my wife showed me a pyramid. Now, I'm going to describe this for most of you people have probably never heard of these dirt mounds. They call them the mounds out in the Midwest. They're, they're, they're just mounds of dirt. You know, to most people, they're just mounds of dirt. Let me describe it. I was down in Mexico City, and I went out to the the uh, ancient pyramids. There's two of them out there. One's called the Pyramid of the Moon, and the other was called the Pyramid of the Sun. And I remember as a young man looking at that Pyramid of the Sun, I said, Oh, my God. These people here in Central America, when they built that pyramid, one of two things had to have occurred. Number one. The Egyptians came over here and saw that pyramid and went back and built some just like it. Or, these Indians went over to Egypt and saw those pyramids and came back here and built one just like it. Or, somebody <clears throat> has been to both places and brought the technology and the design and built it over here or over there. There had to have been contact between the Aztecs and the Incas and so on in order for there to be, in this new world, monuments built on the same architectural design or plan as those in the old world. Now, we don't say that the people of Egypt came from Mexico. We say that the people of Mexico somehow got there from Europe or the Middle East. And I don't know which is which, but I presume that the that the human race migrated out of the Middle East and migrated all over the world. And so, of course, the story that I was told when I went to school was that Christopher Columbus was the first man to sail from Europe to the New World. And when he got here, he found these people, which then devolved upon a a conversation as to how these people got here. And so the logical conclusion was, that since these people did not have an advanced merchant marine, that they weren't sailing around. They had canoes, but they didn't have ships that could cross the Atlantic. Then they must have come from Asia. And when they saw these people, the Western Indians, and they saw that they had Mongol features, they said, ah, they came from Asia. Therefore, they must have crossed the Bering Straits, which is only about 50 or 75 miles. They could make it across there in canoes because we know today that the Eskimos cross from Alaska to Siberia and from Siberia to Alaska. And then somebody came up with this ancient land bridge to fit in with the theory of evolution, and presto, we have the modality by which man got to the new world. That's what I was taught in school. That's what I learned. Now I sit down and I read this book by Barry Fell and I feel like a dunderhead, like a fool. These people that came over here and built those pyramids down there in Central America had to have gotten that idea from somewhere. Now what did they do? Go back across the land bridge for thousands of years and go down to Egypt and they come up across the land bridge? If that was the case, how come nobody ever wrote about it? 
How come we don't see that described by the Egyptians? Hey, we went up across the land bridge, went down to Central America or wherever they wanted to call it or whatever name they hung on it, built a pyramid. 